What's good, party people? Episode 40? Brooksy? What? I'm a man. I'm 40. I'm 40. I'm a man. <laughs> I'm a man. I'm 40. That's wild, man. 40 episodes of Wake and Rake. That's pretty cool, man. We're approaching 50. We should have a lot more, but there's no baseball. Hmm. Cheers to that. Whose fault's that one? And I wish we did have an update, but as we're recording here on Tuesday afternoon, we don't have much. But we do have some rule changes that's apparently being implemented that is being reported by multiple reporters, such as no more shifting, bigger bases. Stupid. Pitch clocks. Weird, but I'll take it. But you know what, Brooksy? We have the perfect man to discuss these updates with. You know who that man is. I know you do. Do you want me to say it? It's not Buster Posey. No, it's Buster Olney. Buster Olney of you. Ever heard of him? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think I've heard of him. So we'll have Buster Olney to join us in 30 years covering Major League Baseball and his resume and it has been at ESPN for at least a couple of decades, I think, at this point now. So and we'll have Buster. Good dude. Good, dude, good dude. dude, for sure. And he's been reporting, too, on free agents. Um, I know that the lockout obviously has impeded teams from really discussing and, and doing anything contract-wise and, and negotiating. But with that said, he reported something on Freddie Freeman that Freddie Freeman may not be coming back to Atlanta. He's made reports on Trevor Story, some of these big-time free whoa, agents. Whoa, whoa, I just want to drop this in. There was a report that the Rays made an offer on Freddie yeah. Freeman. Yes, there was. What is this world coming to, Danny? 200 mil for Wander Franco and then also offering a, a contract to an MVP, Freddie Freeman. And Freddie Freeman, who's looking for, you know, 30 mil plus a year. And that's a team who's been in it every year the past few years with a low imagine? payroll around 100. We'll say around 100 million. I think they were just over 100 last year. So. I mean, that's with Nelly Cruz, too. So that could, I mean, I don't think Freddie leaves Atlanta. I really don't. Probably not. But if he's, why not, you know, two years, $80 million, you get $40 million, you know, kind of the Trevor Bauer deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. But here's the thing is I, the difference in money he's going to get from Atlanta and let's say the Dodgers or the Yankees. Is it going to be that big of a difference from what the Braves are giving him? And I think just the sentiment of, of being a Brave for his whole career will kind of bridge that gap. And just, there's my, something, just my thought. There's something to that still. And I think that is something as years have gone on and, and player movement has increased and baseball has changed. That's something that hasn't changed over the years is when you stay with a team, it's a very it small happen. group of guys. You're Ryan Zimmerman's, you're Pedroia. Derek Jeter's, you're Pedroia's. Guys that were drafted by those franchises went up through the system through that same club and then also retired in the same threads. There's Get something thinking, special about Ryan Braun. Well, yes, but what do you mean? Well, yes, he was drafted by the team and stayed he with his, the team his whole career. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the, the in between what right. happened. Buster Posey, Buster. aforementioned, not Buster only, but Buster Posey. <laughs> But we'll get we into got, a lot of these. Uh, yeah, these say, we got some good stuff. We, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. But first and foremost, let's get to our guy, Buster Olney. Buster Olney, more than 30 years of covering Major League Baseball, in court, including last 19 at ESPN. He is the host of the Baseball Tonight podcast. His writing can be found at ESPN.com. One of the best in the biz. Buster Olney, thanks so much for joining the Wake and Rake podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It was fun to get that request from Will the other day. This is the first ESPN guy we've had, right, Will? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it is actually. Nice. Look at us. Look at us. Just too and big I, for and us. I haven't now, seen apparently. your room there, Will. And I'm looking in the background, and there's Rivera and there's Jeter jersey. That's pretty cool. Yeah, well, Jeter, Rivera, Bill Brooks, you know, same type players. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> I have, there's like bobbleheads. Where am I? Bobbleheads back here. There's Big Poppy uh, and me because, you know, we combine for like 580 career homers. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hang out my college jersey because I didn't want to get made fun of by Brooksy too much. But uh... <laughs> yeah, and uh, my junior varsity jersey from Northfield Mount Hermon, the Hoggers, uh, the Hoggers. In Portland, Western Mass. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I don't think I'm gonna hang that one. <laughs> the plucky left fielder. <laughs> the Hoggers. Yeah. I think that's the first. I don't know if I've ever heard the Hoggers. That's amazing. 
Yeah. And you never I'm, will again. <laughs> I'm guessing they didn't have pitch clocks and larger bases and uh, banning of shifts back then, right, Buster? No, uh, no one worried about pitch clocks because we were all so bad uh, and we <laughs> in the spring in New England that we wanted to get off the field as quickly as possible. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let's get right into it, Buster, because we have a lot to talk about regarding the lockout. As of this time that we're recording on Tuesday, we do not have a deal, but there is hope that we will have a deal by sometime tonight. Is that fair to say? I think it is. Um, look, you know, we wondered nine days ago when they had extended conversations whether or not they would have a deal, but it does feel like that they're closer. When the owners uh, move their uh, CBT number to 228, that to me was one of those signals that, okay, uh, that there is uh, develop some sense of urgency that seems to be coming into this. And I uh, uh, also, you know, last Friday was feeling on the player side, uh, a sense of we need to, to find some sort of a piece of leverage that we can trade to get where we want. And I know this, but, you know, guys were not involved in the negotiations below, uh, you know, below the leadership level. They want to get going. And there are a lot of guys whose uh, careers are in limbo now and they want to get moving. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up careers in limbo because what you've been most concerned about and have been reporting about is the middle class of guys trying to extend their careers. We're not talking about your Max Scherzers making $40 million a year. We're talking about your Todd Frazier type players. Where do you see the future for them, at least in regards to what has been reported so far with the deal? Why are they becoming an afterthought they're going to get crushed in the weeks ahead like if we get a deal in the next 48 hours uh we'll have about three weeks until the start of the season and in that time they're probably going to be something in the range of 250 free agents who need to sign and guess what they're the guys who are going to pay for uh the fact that owners are not generating revenue they're not selling tickets they locked out the players but you know that in front offices, there'll be owners who will say, you know what, uh, we're going to take a 10% hit on ticket sales this year, reduce the budget, you know, from 100 million to 90. And I'm just, you know, pulling numbers out of the sky. And, and while, you know, there certainly have been advances by the players and what we know about this upcoming labor deal, it's a pool of money. For example, uh, they're going to increase the minimum salaries for the youngest players and they're going to have this pool of money for the elite first and second year guys. Well, there's nothing that actually will push the middle class players up because the way teams are going to react on that is, oh, OK, we got to pay minimum salary to, you know, a, a quarter of our team. And that's going to be an extra cost of, you know, three million dollars. Well, just reduce the, the budget on the other players. And, and in talking with agents, they absolutely believe that that, uh, you know, that dynamic is going to be reflected in the contracts we see negotiated in the weeks ahead. And there's nothing in this deal that will help middle class players to prop up the, the free agents, you know, or 28 to 30 to 32 years old. In 2014, the average middle class uh, contract for, for a free agent was $11.8 million. Last winter, that was down to 6.2. And it's straight downhill as teams use analytics to non-tender players to grow the, grow the, uh, you know, the, the free the agent man. group. It's, it, it's not good. I, and I feel bad for those guys. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're talking about guys like Freddie Galvis, Todd Frazier, right? Frazier has, has gone on, but, but that's what we're talking guys about. Guys right? who've been around, but they're not going to get mega deals. They're going to get one, two year. If they're lucky three year deal. You're going to see a lot. You're going to see way more one year, 1.1, 1.2 million dollar deals being passed around this year than you've ever seen before. Guys like Ryan Tapera, okay, he had a terrific 2020 season for the Cubs. And at the end of last year, Jed Hoyer calls him and said, "Uh, Yeah, we're not going to tender you a contract. And he wound up having to negotiate a contract for a reduction in salary to 800,000. He's a free agent again. That's the type of guy who's going to get crushed. You know, I was down in Nashville. uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, Mikey Stramski, Kirk Casale, uh, you know, uh, Phil Goslin was there. Uh, other guys are there who aren't, you know, guys who are going to be doing commercials. They're not superstars. This is the time when they need to make their money. And, and you feel like those are the players are going to be most hurt by the new deal when it comes along. Do you think a lot of something, not a lot, but do you think some of that has to do with just how important the zero to three players are right now? 
Because we've seen over the past, I mean, zero to three, zero to six, wait, both of them, controllable players, players that are making less money, uh, players that you're, players are developed different now. Players get to the big leagues and they're ready. Players don't get to the big leagues. I got to, when I got to the show, they wanted me to get up there with the veteran group and continue to develop. That's not the case anymore. Guys are getting to the show and, and, and they're big leaguers already because of the development programs. You look at teams like the Rays, the way they scout, the way they develop. Guys get there. You don't may not know who they are, but they're going to compete at a big league level uh, for the entire year. So I don't know if, if there's just a, a more of a – it's more of a premium, or like zero to three controllable players and teams trying to load their roster with that to save money. Or I don't know. It's just it's something I'm just trying to figure out. It's the manifestation of analytics. Um, I really believe that what has gone on is front offices. You know, Kevin Towers, a late great general manager, uh, referred to them as propeller heads. And he actually meant it affectionately. But they decided at some point, you know what? Uh, we feel like we can find a 22-year-old who can do the same thing that the 34-year-old veteran can do. Uh, so we're going to, and the 34-year-old veteran might cost us $5 million. The 22-year-old, we can pay minimum salary or just above minimum. Yeah. And so they have exploited that group of younger players. And you understand why the player associations made an effort to prop those guys up in this negotiation. Uh, however, as we've gone along uh, in this negotiation, you know, the, the, the way that you can help the middle class players, I think, is to restructure the financial system, at least to some degree, right? So that the, those guys get paid more because the response of the teams, I think, in the next few years is going to be, OK, we're going to pay the younger players more. That means we're going to ten, non-tender more players when they get to, you know, ages uh, or years three, four and five in their service time. Yeah. And that'll hit the middle class even more. I mean, you think about how crazy it was that last winter, uh, in, in the winter of 2020 to 21, here, here's Kike Hernandez, a terrific major league player. He signed for two for 14. Mark Melanson, you know, this excellent reliever, proven 35 saves every year. He got one year and $3 million from the Padres. That's a joke that guys in that position are getting that kind of money. And they're the reason why we've seen over the last five years, the numbers go down for average player salary. Yeah. It seems like on the surface, just upon hearing this, it's really bullpen guys that'll be impacted the most, certainly utility guys, fourth outfielders, but it seems like you mentioned Ryan Tapera. It's a perfect example. Guys that have a sat relievers, especially have a hard time with durability and or sustainability. So to me, that indicates to me that, when they hit free agency, there's not a lot of trust in giving a reliever to three-year contracts. And to, that, to me, on the surface, upon what you're saying, it seems like relief pitchers are going to be hit hardest by this impending deal. 100%. 100 agree. I, I think the number uh, of unsigned relievers now is something in the range of 40 to 70. Um, I, you know, I, I had a conversation a month ago about that, about that volume. And one of the surprises for me in terms of what the player association pushed for in this negotiation, I thought based on conversations I had last summer that they would want to try to foster rules that would help to restore the preeminence of the starting pitchers, because let's face it. I mean, the Rays are the best example. What they decided was, look, we can't pay, you know, a Max Scherzer to come in and lead our staff, but we can uh, by the use of our bullpen have seven or eight guys throw a 98 <laughs> who we pay almost nothing to, and that's how we construct the pitching staff. Well, as that strategy has been has evolved, the starting pitchers are getting less and less responsibility, fewer and fewer innings, and they used to be the standard bearers for making money for pitchers. And I, again, I, I thought for sure the union in this negotiation would push for, okay, a maximum of five relievers per game or something that would reverse that trend. And it's not only... Uh, aesthetically, I think you know, people who watch baseball don't like the parade of relievers. I thought for the union as a financial matter, it's really important because those relievers, as you say, they're, you know, teams are going to rely on them, but they're disposable. They're like running backs in the NFL and teams are not going to pay those guys. Another, another, I was just thinking about this as we were talking about the middle class and guys who signed to come in and compete for a job in spring training there's going to be a, guy, a lot of guys without jobs because there it won't be time for competition. 
They're going to say, here's our guys. Here's our team. Here's a couple guys maybe that can try to make the team if we have a spot, but we don't have time to watch you guys compete. We need to get a team together, figure out how to play as a team, and then it's time to go. So 100%. that's going to leave a lot of guys out. Uh, and I've wondered, and I, you know, I don't mean to, to speak to each guy's case specifically because I haven't talked to them individually. You do wonder if we had this labor situation settled, say, last August, you know, the way we, Michael Wiener used to do deals. It felt like they would announce it around the World Series time um, that guys like Kyle Seeger, you know, if baseball's uh, landscape was completely settled, would he have necessarily walked away? Or, you know, maybe in November, if we knew we were going to have a start on time, would he have been a guy who'd say, you know what, I want to jump in with the Mets or some team on a short-term deal? Ryan Zimmerman, you know, would he have stuck around? Uh, you know, John Lester, you know, and he had physical issues. Maybe that kept him away. But I know in talking with players, they feel like that that incentive for older guys and now with everything that's gone on, it's almost chased away some of them from the joy <laughs> of what you guys all got into when you started playing baseball. That's really interesting. I, I didn't even think about that from the first. Everybody believes Cal Seeger left too soon. It seems to be maybe there's some more reason and some more layers behind that. That's really interesting. Um, let me ask you this shifts and large bases and pitch clock that has been reported to be this being discussed right now in, in the new updates regarding the CBA. Now with that uh, supposedly reportedly owners want a 14 team expanded playoff. Of course they do. Sh should we expect <laughs> to see all of the above? Should we expect to see shifts, bigger bases, pitch clocks and an expanded postseason? Or is this just added negotiating tactics from each side? I think that uh, that there's a chance that they land on 14. You know, last week when they were theoretically making progress, they agreed on 12. But as you're sitting in the players union perspective, uh, that's a nice piece of leverage for them. You know, the owners clearly want the 14 team playoff field. They've negotiated with my employer, which would televise that. Uh, there's money to be made there as they do the horse trading down the stretch. It wouldn't surprise me if we see 14 teams on the others. Um, let's face it, you know, we've heard the conversation in recent years about trying to, you know, make the game faster to move it along to, you know, uh, to increase the pace of action, which is why uh, I remember the first time that Rob in an interview with Carl Ravitch, right when he became commissioner of baseball, uh, Carl said, would you do something like ban the shifts? And I just remember thinking, that's ridiculous. Who's going to ever think about banning the shifts? Well, you know what? They're old time baseball people now who are in favor of a rule, you know, referred to as spikes in the dirt, you know, rather than those elaborate defenses where Manny Machado seems to be standing in the right field corner, yeah. uh, putting on a shift for the Padres. I've heard more old school guys say we, we have to do something to help the offenses. Uh, the pitch clock would be interesting because I'm sure that there'd be a lot of players who won't like that. I was communicating with some of them yesterday. 14 seconds is accelerated, but there are a lot of folks in the sport who believe the game needs to move faster. It, it does need to move faster. I, I, it's not length of game. It's pace of game. Right. No more balls in play. Right. Um, I think, I think a pitch clock at 20 all the way around is fair. I could even start see them starting at 25. I know the average last year was about 25, so it wouldn't change a whole lot. Um, but just as a first year implementing a clock that guys maybe aren't used to started at 25 and then you can go to 20 next year. Just a thought. I don't know. I, I, I think a pitch clock will be fine. I had it in the minor leagues towards the end of my career and you just forget about it. It, it fades into the distance and you don't even know. It'll be the same way with the bigger bases, which I think is ridiculous. I get player safety and this and that. I haven't seen many guys. The only one that sticks out to me is obviously the Machado play with him getting stepping on the guy at first, uh, first base. Uh, you remember like way back, like Jason Kendall breaking his ankle on first Cliff base. Floyd, remember Cliff Floyd? Yes, Floyd yes. First base. But that's it's a handful of injuries. I don't see I, – I can't quite put my finger on – I don't know if you have a reasoning behind that. If it's – I've heard promoting base stealing, which I don't know how that would do so. I don't know. I, I would love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, no, I, and I, I'm the same way as you are in that regard. I think mostly what I've heard, the, the players I've talked to are in favor of it. Or it's about player safety. Yeah. Uh, Double plays, them, things like that, I would think. Right, exactly. Uh, and that's clearly the direction of the sport over the last 15 years, you know, since the home play collision rule started to go into effect. Um, and in the pitch clock, look, I, I think that 
if you go back and watch any game uh, from 25 or 30 years ago, and I think it was Fangraphs that did a study on this once, there's no question the game feels different. You know, the pitchers, generally speaking, will stay on the mound and the hitters most of the time will stay in the box. Um, I, I have had old school guys in the sport who 10 years ago used to say, stop complaining, it's baseball. Now are like, you know what, seven innings doesn't sound so bad. Uh, even CC Sabathia, you know, recently had a conversation and he was like, yeah, the game drags to some degree. Um, and, I, and I do think it needs that. And I have a great focus group of one. I have a 17 year old son who's a huge sports fan, loves the Braves, Titans, Hornets. Uh, and I ask him to sit and watch baseball with me. And his response is it's too slow. And he, I just think that's the generation of fans you're trying to appeal to. And you better find a way to do that. Do you, do you think pitching has just gotten the elite level of stuff has gotten ahead of hitters? Matt obviously matched up with the hitters approach now and launch a going, getting on playing with the baseball and hitting in the air. And the fact that teams incentivize players to hit for power and slug, nobody pays players to be David Eckstein anymore. That, that doesn't exist. It, David Eckstein doesn't get to the big leagues anymore. It doesn't matter if you get 320 every year in the minor leagues. Now, if you don't slug, you don't get a chance. They're paying the guys to hit homers. They're paying guys to, that throw gas. And ultimately, I feel like that's hurt the product of, of the game in general. That's what I think. Uh, I think all the swing and miss, that the fact that you can go, literally, I've had games in Sunday Night Baseball where we were 12 to 15 minutes between a ball put and play. Yeah. You know what? That's, that's not great. Uh, when I, and I think it's absolutely because uh, you know, the implementation of the, the parade of relievers, everybody coming out throwing 98 uh, and the fact is, is the pitchers trained to throw velocity, unlike in any point. Look, I, I covered uh, when I first started covering Major League Baseball, the best hit the other way hitter you've ever seen in Tony Gwynn. Right. But the guys he was going against, they're throwing, you know, a, a, you know, they're working on a regular basis, 87 to 90. They're not throwing 95 to 98 uh, because they knew they needed to throw seven innings, too. Exactly. Yeah. They're sprinters as opposed to distance runners. Right. And it's completely changed. And I think player, you know, players clearly are in better shape than they've ever been. Uh, the way they train to throw velocity is better than it's ever been. And it's a, I mean, and I'm speaking out of school here. I'm only echoing what I hear from players like yourself. That fact is it's just harder than ever to hit. Hitting's really hard right now. I agree. So you can't just hit the ball the other way, Will? Just, right, just it poke way. it the other way. It's the, <laughs> Just lay a bunt down. That's what I said. Nobody wants to come to the park and watch Fernando Tatis lay a bunt down. Right. Nobody wants to see the superstar bunt. It's not It's not that they can't do it. Even, I mean, bunting 98 is not easy either. <laughs> strategy, Will. It's all it is strategy. strategy. You know what? But not in the third inning. Not in the third inning. I'm with you, brother. In the seventh, you. eighth, ninth inning, bunt that guy over. But if he's a tying run or the winning run, I'm all for that. That's that's good baseball. But in the third inning, I it's know. not my job if I'm a slugger to go up there and go clog the base pass. I'm not going to steal second. Maybe with these enlarged bags, I will. Who knows? But <laughs> not, it's well, going to take two. Put, it's going to put seven and you know five foot seven and nothing. Uh, and I, I, I covered the NFL for one year with the New York times, New York giants. And I stood on the sideline for those practices and I was blown away by how fast these guys were. And you think this game is so much faster than the casual fan feels. Uh, when I covered the year before, when I was covering the Yankees, I covered Mike Messina for three years. He once asked me, Hey, you want to stand in the box while I'm throwing a bullpen? I'm like, dude, I, I, I would be, my face would be crumpled before he realized the ball even hit me. Okay. Let alone. And I'm like, I trust you. I don't trust me. And I think that's what casual fans don't understand is so amazing about what you guys do uh, is the ability to hit a baseball moving that much at that velocity, especially with the additional velocity and the additional spin is crazy. So the whole thing about, Oh, just slap it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't really have a right to laugh, but I do laugh at that. Another another aspect that I talked about on Twitter today with people was you don't realize that these are professional pitchers that are going to pitch you into the, the shift as well. Right. So it's not it's not it's it's not that you're choosing not to go the other way. When you have 97 bearing in on your hands, like you don't have you can't go the other way. And then you have to be ready to get the head out on 97, 98. Of course you're gonna roll over the changeup away. <laughs> of course right. you are. 
Yeah. It's hey, just, yeah, JP, it's Aaron Cibia, JP Aaron Cibia chimed in on that conversation. And he talked about that specifically. Uh, you know, you're, it's not like you have a full range. And, and as the pitch is coming in, you're thinking, hmm, do I hit this out or do I just slap it the other way? Doesn't right, work right. like that. No. You need to take a walk, Brooksy. You all right, bro? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to be okay. Good. I'm sweating a little, but I'm good. Let me, I know you have a busy schedule, Buster, but let me shift gears into one last conversation piece. So the only thing guaranteed, there's a lot of uncertainties. The only thing guaranteed is that we're going to have a frenzy of a free agency whenever the season does begin. You had reported that Freddie Freeman, that there's growing belief that Freddie Freeman will not return to, to Atlanta. Is that still out there? Is that still a belief among your sources? Yes. Now it can change. Uh, with one phone call, you know, the, the Braves made a ton of money last year. They finished second uh, in attendance in the, in a season, which was greatly attendance was greatly affected by the pandemic. Uh, they made a ton of money with their postseason run. Uh, Freddie is a, you know, franchise guy. If they gave him a six year in their offer, I think that they would work it out. But I think what's happened is, is this negotiation. And I think Freddie would be inclined to stay there if like, if the numbers are equal, um, but I think what the Braves ownership has done is turn this into a competition and don't want to turn it into a competition. If you're a team and you're negotiating with a player, the question is, if not the Braves, then who? Cause I don't think there are a lot of teams out there who could take a, you know, be willing to invest big money in a 32 year old first baseman, uh, you know, say on a five or six year deal, the Yankees, for example, on paper would be a good fit. You know what? They already got Garrett Cole signed. They already have Giancarlo Stanton signed. I think they're clearly angling to put themselves in position for Judge, you, especially with the way the Yankees have taken their payroll down. They're not going to pay four guys $30 million a year. It's just, it's, I don't think it's going to work out. The Dodgers are probably the biggest candidate everyone's wondering about. Uh, they've had money come off the books. Seager leaves. Freddie's a California guy. Uh, the Dodgers probably with their strategy of paying guys on shorter term deals more lucrative uh, year to year, maybe they, and I'm spitballing here, maybe they offer them four years, 140, you know, $35 million a year. Uh, I wonder about the Blue Jays who were clearly poised to spend money before we had the December 1st shutdown. Boy, he would be amazing there. Uh, you guys saw the report that the Tampa Bay Rays made him some sort of an offer. He's so well-respected in the sport. He's such a you know, a good hitter, a Tony Gwynn type hitter, you know, with the way that he, he hits the ball to all fields with power, good leader. Uh, I, I think unless the Braves make that jump, I think he's going to leave. Did you imagine that Blue Jays lineup with a Freddie Freeman? In oh, it? my gosh. I just can't the picture him hitter another they uniform. Need, right? Man. The left-handed hitter they need? Man. I just can't, I just can't picture him in another uniform. I, I really, I say that about Tom Brady too. So That's right. we'll see. Exactly right. right. Buster, we can't thank you enough for your time. Um, check out his podcast, Baseball Tonight Podcast, and all of his articles and latest can be found on ESPN.com when he's not joining us on the Wake and Rake, of course. Buster, thanks so much, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Buster. Absolutely. Anytime, guys. I want to really get your thoughts and dive deeper on the shift that could be happening, the banning of the shift. What, upon first glance, what are your thoughts on it? And, what do you, what is your response to people that just say just hit it the other way? <laughs> I well well first off I'm not a I don't I'm not sure I'm a full advocate of completely banning the shift. I feel like it's the big leagues. You should be able to put seven guys in left field if you really want to. Mm -hmm. um, it's a tough one. I I understand it. Um, I initially thought they would just alter it. Like you have to be on the dirt. But from what I'm hearing from my guys in these meetings is that it's going to be two and two shortstop has to be at least even with second base. He can't be past it until the pitch is being thrown. Now, if the pitch is being thrown, they can, they're going to allow the defenders to be a little more athletic, meaning kind of like a rotation as the pitch is being thrown, they can kind of work towards second base, but that's going to cause a lot of issues with the guys on the run. Say the ball's hit up the middle and you're on the run. It's behind you, you know? Yeah. Not to mention so, guys are throwing one Oh two, you right. have half a second to react. <laughs> Right, but that gives you a couple steps in yeah. that direction. If you have the analytics and the numbers saying if he hits it on the ground 80% of the time, it's over here. Get your momentum going one way. Right. So I think we're going to see some type of like rolling defenses, kind of like how, you know, you see in football, they roll from cover three to cover two, uh, you mm -hmm. know, right pre-snap, like similar things to that. Um, I think there are some positives 
with banning the shift, even though I'm not completely for it. I think we see way more web jumps, way more great defensive plays because players aren't going to be standing exactly where the analytics tell you they're going to hit the ball. Guys are going to have to make diving plays, jump throws, spins. You're going to see some really cool double plays because it's really hard to turn double play. You think about a shift. A lot of times it's a third baseman coming over to second base to take the turn. That's not your most athletic middle infielder for a lot of teams. So um, you're going to see a lot of more fun double plays. But not only that, guys are going to get rewarded for hard hit balls now. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, not not being rewarded for the the jam job bleeder where the third baseman should be because you took a terrible swing on a really good pitcher's pitch that was in because he's pitching you into the shift, but he blew you up and you were so late and it broke your bat so bad that it dribbled to third base where no one's standing and you get rewarded a hit. Mm -hmm. So it takes that away. So, um. And, and, and another, my last thing on this is, is no one, and people argue on Twitter with me about this, but no, no one wants to go watch superstars bunt. Like, like, here's my bunt single. I know you're here to watch me hit the ball in the gap and run and hit it out of the park and be an explosive player, but here's my little, my bunt because they gave it to me. That's boring. That's bad for the, for the product of baseball. This will encourage pace of play, more balls in play, more hits, more base runners. Hopefully that'll equate to more stolen bases. Uh, and the ball and runners on the move more. So I think faster pace. A lot of people are saying, well, more more base runners means longer game. That doesn't make sense. But if if you're, as a hitter, if you're facing a shift, you have to wait for the pitcher to miss over the plate. He's mm -hmm. going to pitch you in. He's going to throw you soft away. So you have to be more selective. You're taking more pitches. You're getting deeper in accounts. I think we see guys more active early in counts because guys are going to pitch differently. You can't just keep pounding them in to pitch them into a shift if there isn't one. So there's going to be more pitches over the plate, I think, and balls will be in play more. So that, that's my take on it. I think, I think we see some positive things come out of it. I think there's a time and place for bunting. I, I don't want to just completely say there's never, you know, the practice. right time to bunt. I don't think you're saying that at all. But no, practice. Late, no I'm saying late in games, right. like seventh, eighth, ninth inning, especially important games. Yeah. Move the, get the tie and run on first or, or winning run on first. Bottom them over, get them in scoring right. position. That that's good baseball. Now in the third inning, I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, late in games, you need to manufacture that run. That's different. I used to be completely. I mean, when I say used to, I mean as recently as last year. I used to be completely team. Just hit the ball the other way. I used to be completely team. Mm -hmm. If they want to put seven guys in left field, let them put seven guys in left field. I used to think that way. I did. The more guys I've spoken to, the more I've watched, the more I've learned. I think it comes down to one simple question. Do shifts help the product of the game? And I think objectively, the answer is no. Objective. 100% no. And for that reason, if it's hurting the game, a game that's already been hurt by COVID shortened seasons, CBAs, lockout, you know, blah, 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 blah. It, it's easily fixable by one simple rule. And not to mention... The NBA, you are not allowed, the defender is not allowed to stand in the key for three seconds or longer. It gets a three-second call. In the NFL, linemen are not allowed to run downfield on a pass. Um, in soccer, there's offsides. In hockey, there's offsides. Like, different sports, when you go across the board, they're delegating where players are allowed to stand. Baseball doesn't. Other than obviously, you know, staying in the box, staying on the mound. I mean, there's that. It's still aspect. really hard to get a hit, regardless it if it's a shift or not. For sure. Oh, so it's. So, yeah. so that and we talked that, about this. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I'm sorry. I just, I'm talking in circles at this point, but I just think if you can fix a problem with one simple rule while not completely dissecting the game for what it is, I think you do it because it's already a game that's hurting. And if it can be fixed with a snap of fingers, do it, man, do it. Yeah. I think even if it can just help 1% make it a little bit better, that's all we can ask. For sure. And people are going to forget about it. This is something like it's a big deal right now. They're like, oh, if you're a professional hitter, you should be able to adjust. Just adjust. We talked about this already. Pitching is really good. They're going to pitch you into the shift. It's just, it's, they miss. Yeah, they miss. But if they miss, you're not going to poke it the other way. You're going to hit a homer. So, yeah. and I saw this uh, earlier. People that are complaining about the big bags, like, I don't love the optics of big bags, but like, who, who cares? Like, it's not like you're going to be sh they're not gonna showing forget up about it. No, yeah, it, yeah. after 30 games, like you're not even going to be talking about it. It's, I refuse to watch. I refuse to watch baseball because they have 
bigger right. bag. Like, no chance that's happening. Come on yeah. now. Let's I let's big, be real, guys. I got a big bag for you. Hey, great pod, brother. Uh, it was, you know, obviously a joy having Buster on a lot of insight, but we have a Buster's lot coming awesome. down the pipeline. Hopefully we get a deal soon. I mentioned last time on the last episode, I'm hoping that we're gonna be talking baseball on the next episode. Here we are not exactly talking baseball, but hopefully we're creeping closer. We're hearing good things. Both of us are hearing good things. We're so at hopefully... uh, fake deadline number three. Yeah, exactly. Well, so, uh, we might have one six. Well, we we could have one sixty two. Look, it's a they they can do whatever they want. That's yeah. if you've learned anything from this ownership and the league can do whatever they want whenever they want it. Amen. So yeah, here here yeah, we'll see. As long I I, I don't expect a deal tonight. I expect them to make progress tonight. Mm-hmm. And if they make progress, that's promising for the next two weeks to get a deal done. And then by the end of April, we have baseball. I don't, I, and we talked about this before. I don't think teams want to play in April unless they can get the players to sign a deal that is in their favor. So, right now, it's not just players versus owners. I'm telling you, it is owners versus owners in a big way about the CBT because when it comes to teams surpassing the luxury tax, if, if they go over it and they're having to pay those penalty taxes, that money that is paid goes to teams that did not pass the threshold and to player benefits like insurance and things like that. Um, so the lower, smaller market teams, of course they want a lower CBT because then there's more penalty money to help them on the back end of the season. So that's something a lot of people don't know. And I've just recently learned that I've talked to my guys, figuring that out. So it's not just players versus owners. There's a lot of owners versus owners because it takes 23 of 30 votes from the owners to either pass on something or vote something in. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I'm going to speak it into existence. Next episode, we're talking baseball and we're talking about when opening day is going to take place. I'm, I'm speaking it into existence. Baby. Free agency. Until next time, party people. Peace. Peace.